Puppeteers who work in film and television and now streaming services have to keep a close eye on the contracts they are offered when they agree to work on a project. This episode, I sit down with Kevin Carlson to discuss union contracts, what those contracts should and should not say, and what to do if you're presented with a contract that just doesn't look right. There's a lot of good information that you need to hear in this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that talks to puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. Welcome to an app-exclusive episode of Under the Puppet. This episode, we are talking union contracts and how they relate to puppeteers. If you are a SAG after a union puppeteer or have plans to be one someday, this is an episode you'll want to take notes on. My guest is Kevin Carlson, who I interviewed back in episode number nine. And as you'll hear, Kevin is super knowledgeable and passionate about puppeteers and their relationship with both the union and the producers who offer us contracts. Here now is my talk with Kevin Carlson. Well, Kevin Carlson, welcome back to Under the Puppet. Well, thank you, Grant. Thank, good to be here. I'm super excited to have you back on the show. And uh, today we're going to be talking about television and film contracts. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Everybody's favorite topic. Everybody. Well, it's, it may not be, but it's something I think everybody should know about. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. it's your livelihood. Yep. Yep. As a puppeteer. No doubt. And it's something you were very passionate about as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've had a puppeteer caucus within the Screen Actors Guild since 1989. Mm-hmm. And uh, a caucus is a group within a bigger group, basically. People that don't know what caucus means because it is, you know, election season coming up. And so <laughs> it kind of throws people off. However, um, Tony Urbano and Aaron Oscar, Mark Brian Wilson, um, Tim Blaney, a few others, um, we got together at Tony's shop in 1989 to discuss puppeteer issues and why uh, producers don't want to pay us as principal performers. And a lot of those issues we were facing back in 1989 are still issues we're facing now. Mm -hmm. So our caucus grew over the years. Uh, We would have meetings, uh, you know, twice a year, three, sometimes once a month. It depended on what was happening in the industry. And there was a lot of times where there was uh, uh, major grievances from from uh, like Paramount and Warner Brothers. They just would try to eliminate our principal performer status. And we do, we would all stand up and say no and wave the flag. And so uh, I'm grateful to Tony and Aaron and Tim and Mark and those guys who who – who decided to, you know, we need to wave the flag and head head these people off, the capitalistic, greedy producers, and uh, and let them know that we're not going to just bounce so and just sign whatever contract you give us. Right. You know, we did become a committee, an actual national committee. So we had, um, uh, I was the last known former chair of the national committee. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we lost our committee status because we kind of got apathetic and we didn't have meetings and follow the guidelines like we were supposed to, but we're still a caucus and we're still, uh, you know, puppeteers pop up and there's, you know, the, the screen actors guild has a lot of turnover within the, within the staff and contracts. And, uh, in fact, recently we had an issue with, uh, the movie space jam two and, uh, there was four puppeteers that, um, were were being strangled by saying that there's no residuals and and the, the evil thing was that it was the day before they showed up on set they got an email saying oh yeah and by the way there's no residuals there's no uh, you know they no residuals I mean that's huge right and it's like yeah. so they show up and they they're handed a stunt contract and it's like no so you know they call SAG and um, you know. And then some SAG contract people would say, oh, we cover puppeteers? And when I found that out, I, I got incensed. I, yeah. I made some calls and said, you know, what is happening, you guys? We're, we're principal performers. We're in both of the major contracts. We're in the theatrical contract and the commercials contract. I mean, what, how, can, how can you not know about us? Right. And it's just because of turnover and whatever. So we did this demonstration at SAG. We showed how we puppeteers work, um, you know, with uh, – 
hand, simple hand puppets to animatronic puppets. Uh, we had Rick Lazzarini he brought Slimer mm-hmm. from Ghostbusters. Um, and then uh, Mark Rappaport brought a, a unicorn pony that's a realistic looking pony unicorn, which takes, you know, six people to operate. Right. So we were able to show the staff. It's like, no, each person has a part in this one whole character. And that's why we're principal performers, you know. Right. So that was a, a beneficial to kind of get them uh, up to speed. At least we educated them enough to, you know, get things happening and let them represent us right. as they do. Yeah. Well, why do you think, um, and I know there's a lot of answers to this, but I, I'm just stripping it down to the basics. Why is the union a good thing? Okay. Why Why should we puppeteers who work in TV and film want to be in the union? Well, uh, that's the, the brass ring or that, you know, that... It, I mean, if you're a professional puppeteer, you want to be union. Uh, because if you're a non-union puppeteer, you're not getting any uh, pension or health benefits. You're just getting a chunk of change. Mm-hmm. And with union, you're getting supported as a professional. And, uh, you know, uh, no, it's it's you want to be a professional puppeteer. And union puppeteers, you know, th- there's two classifications, I think, Within our group, we have Muppet style performers like you, you and me. We're we're more character driven. We can drive characters, vocally acting, all the chutzpah, singing that goes along with performing a character. Right. And then there's the technical puppeteers that do like uh, special effects and creature effects, like Baby Yoda, super popular. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Right. And and then there's shop owners that that you know build the the characters. And then hire their shop people to do the, the the technical puppeteering, which is not so much acting per se, but it's technical. But they're still covered as principal performers. And they want those jobs because, yeah, and they the shop owners can pay minimum wage or whatever they pay for working in the shop by dangling the, the, the Screen Actors Guild contract so that they can make some money and also pension and health so it's it that's just kind of how it has evolved and we've come together as a group because we all share the same desire to maintain our principal performer status and also you know earn earn sag money and none of us are really over scale we're scale performers Mm -hmm. for the most part middle class actors you know and scale has been is is pretty decent i mean if you work on a project and you get scale, I mean, it's not horrible, <laughs> right. you know, it's in, in your earning pension and health and producers are, are paying into it. So yeah, union's a good thing. And if you're, and if you're non-union, but you want to become union, you know, that's kind of the breaking point or, or the starting point basically. I mean, cause you have to either taft Hartley to get in or you have to have like a shop owner say, Oh, I need this guy because he, he built, and he knows exactly what needs to be done and how to operate it, and he's rehearsed it, and so yeah, that's why he should be Taft Heart lead. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and um, you you mentioning principal performers, and I just want to be clear for maybe people who don't know a lot. A principal performer is somebody like an actor, an actor, an actress who's in Robert a film. Downey Jr. Right. Tom Cruise. Tom, Tom Hanks. <laughs> right. Renee Zellweger. <laughs> our our principal performers. And um, any actor you see, except for like background necessarily uh, in a movie as well, but our, our principal performers. Um, and you are saying that um, the SAG after puppeteer, you've said this before, the SAG after puppeteer is an actor with the same skills as their colleagues, but with a twist because they have to create this performance that Tom Hanks is creating, but through right. an inanimate object. Exactly. Or even being a supporting character. Right. Doing a scene with Tom Hanks. I mean, right. But our faces aren't seen, right? So there's there's language in the contract, you know, it's like if your performance or or if your face is unrecognizable, then we're not going to pay residuals. Right. And we puppeteers and the stunt community have fought tooth and nail telling the producers that no, you've captured our performance and our performance is worthy of residuals. And so yeah, we don't let them get away with that anymore. <laughs> right. You know. Right. It's a Uh, special twist. uh, So the fact is that it's physically demanding. Um, It's like I I also use the the term uh, or the uh, the idea that, you know, uh, if someone hands you a saxophone, sure, you could make noise. But can you make music? 
Right. You know, and it's the, the, uh, I always, uh, when I'm teaching someone how to become a puppeteer, I use that analogy so that they understand that it's like, oh, yeah, you can you can goof around, but then it's like getting down to the technique and the craft and to making this believable character breathe and live and make people laugh and et cetera. You know, it takes some time. Yeah. It takes skill. And skill. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? It takes a lot of luck, too, I think. I mean... I just remember when I was Taft Hartley, Tony Urbano actually helped me get into uh, the union, and I had to call my wife and say, well, "You need to bring a deposit to the Screen Actors Guild." And luckily, she was home and available, <laughs> so so I could I got in. And I tell you, the first time I had uh, uh, mailbox money, a, a residual for like a hundred sixty bucks or something, that was like a banner day. It's yeah. Like, Whoa! This is I'm part of a production that made enough money to continue and we're part of the success. And so they're, the pie is being kind of, you know, given out and I got us a little slice and it was like, this is good. I'm in the right business. Right. You right. know? Well, and often, I mean, I found out uh, last year, not to get too much into to my working last year, but for the most part of last year, I didn't, didn't work. Oh. Uh, I didn't, I couldn't, I was, you know, doing my own thing kind of, but I, I there right. wasn't any, uh, there were projects going on, but I didn't seem to get auditions or whatever. And so there were times where it's like, oh, I get that residual check in the mail for a project I'd work on two years ago. Right. And it's like, well, this is going to help me because oh, I'm not getting this work. Yeah. And um, residuals are just so, you know, everyone, I don't know, everyone thinks like, hey, I'm getting residuals uh, by my Rolls Royce. And it's like, no, no it could just help you continue. Help you to survive. Look for work. Right. Yeah. It helps you survive. In fact, I, I'm at the point in my career now, too, where maybe almost a fourth of my income is from residuals yeah and uh boy it comes in handy when you're trying to pay bills and and it's like you need to cover stuff it's like well thank you you know <laughs> right. thank you very much i like pie yeah pie's good <laughs> yeah um well you, you mentioned this before um sometimes puppeteers get offered contracts that say stunt or they say utility performer or non-photographed as you said when we get a contract what should our contract say puppeteer Puppeteer. Principal performer, puppeteer. It shouldn't say anything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is part of the producer's greed and capitalistic approach to trying to whittle us down. And they figured, uh, it's kind of a long story, but um, there was a side letter years ago where the producers wanted to be able to, if there was a classification that they couldn't, like, identify with a clear definition, uh, then they could assign whatever contract that was close closest to it and it happened to be stunts and that's because of consecutive employment consecutive employment is uh, let me describe this so that sure. it's easy to understand but i'm i'm still trying to get my head <laughs> around it too uh, consecutive employment is like if you're on a, mo a movie a movie shoot that's going to last 18 weeks they have you in the first week right and you work a week well then they want to have you come back and do another scene, whatever, a month later. Well, principal performers get paid to be on hold right. for those times, so they don't want you to go away and do other projects and stuff. They want to make sure that you finish the film, right? Right. But with puppeteers, you don't see our faces, so consecutive <laughs> employment didn't really apply that much. And a lot of shop owners, you know, have businesses. They have their own shops, and, and they're okay with giving up consecutive employment. Because they have jobs, they have their they have income with their jobs, and so it became a little bit of a battle between us Muppet style performers or whatever. Because whoa, I got paid on hold on a movie, and wow, that's that makes you feel pretty good. Yeah, they're holding they're holding my services, so I don't you know take off and go to Bermuda, right. Um, yeah, I, t I I worked on a project where I got hold pay. Yeah, and I was, and it also makes you like, yep, I'm available for you whenever you. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. Like, I'll just be at my house, yeah. but you let me know if yeah. you need me. No, it is nice. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So basically, this uh, when when our committee was in full guns in 2003 or whatever, we went to a side meeting, not not the actual collective bargaining agreement, but it was with the AMPTP, which is Paramount, Disney, Warner Brothers, all the majors. And we had some business affairs people there from SAG. We had um, there was a whole group on the other side. So it was a it was a conference table side meeting, 
specifically about dealing with puppeteers because in the contract negotiations we we were asking for a, a definition change you know or or they wanted they're trying to force us into scheduling out what it is we do and in my opinion it's dangerous we should stay with our definition of puppeteer because mm-hmm. it's vague in the theatrical contract it's vague it just says puppeteer which gives us a latitude to do the various interesting methods and techniques and each character has its own specific needs so you can't define it and by scheduling it out what i mean by that is that they would want us to have like the assistant puppeteer has a lower rate at, and can only work these many hours or whatever you know right uh and then ancillary puppeteers background puppeteer blah 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 so we don't want to do that because right. that just diminishes our value and it just cuts money out of our pockets, basically. Well, and also there's several projects I've worked on where it's like sometimes I'm a background puppeteer, and in the same day that I'm a puppet that's in the front, in and front of the principal. camera. Exactly. Yeah, that's the way it works. And and I think what we've done in the past and what we've kind of stayed on the course of is when there's a movie like Team America where you have a, a gazillion puppets, but they can't afford to pay all of us principal rates, Right. 60 puppeteers i mean that that eats up the whole budget of the film basically right. so we came to an agreement with a waiver for a background puppeteer rate right which included residuals and included pension and health mm-hmm. at 250 a day which is not horrible compared to what a regular background performer makes they only make like 110 dollars a day right. for an 8 hour day so that but then was, when you also put in the the health and pension, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it all adds up. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some people grumbled about it because there were principal performers that were doing the lead characters that had, you know, the marionettists and some of the facial animation puppeteers. They were on regular principal contracts. But the 50 other puppeteers were day players or on those big days where there were lots of performers. In fact, uh, in that grouping, there was, you know, maybe 60 puppets. And so there was almost 60 performers working that day. Right. Um, and we don't do that all the time, but it was we granted a waiver. We negotiated with the production so that they didn't go to Canada and just do it non-union because they were threatening that. Um, so we kind of came to this agreement, which kind of worked out pretty well. And there were some abuses, I think. There was a lot of, like, background performers that all of a sudden got shifted onto a principal character and so then it was like well wait a minute now i'm doing principal work so there, there was a little bit of that I, yeah and it was kind of like how do you uh anyways yeah Team america <laughs> and there's other instances too but i don't want to talk about them sure sure <laughs> well let's let, let me give you a hypothetical um i'm i'm a beginning puppeteer this is my first sag job um you know and i get to the set and they hand me a contract and it doesn't say puppeteer it doesn't say principal performer puppeteer what do i do yeah in that moment well th- i suggest you tell the person who handed it to you well, this contract is wrong because i'm a principal performer a puppeteer and look in the contract because the collective bargaining agreement protects me as a principal performer so by calling me this you're mislabeling me and i, just, I don't want to make waves but this is wrong right and usually it goes back up to the office or whatever. The, the AD, whoever handed you the contract, they, they don't know. But they're also being instructed to, like, try to get your signature on it as fast as you can. Right. You know, and by, by saying, no, I'm not ready to sign this contract, you know, they think, oh, he's a problem. But you have to be that way. You have to stand up for yourself. And if you do it in the beginning, if you do it right at the beginning, then you're, you're making a statement and you're also showing the producers that, no, we're not going to just be kicked around. And because the the process has been, if there's something like that that happens, SAG's MO was, well, sign it, and then we'll grieve it later. Right. And we hate that. Yeah. Because their stack of grievances is so big, they it takes months and maybe years to, to get to the bottom of it, and you're only going to get a third of what you probably should have been making from the beginning. So head them off at the pass in the very beginning, you know? Yeah. And it's hard because a lot of times on... Uh, shows and movies and whatever they're like well we got to get going come on we got to sign this we got to get going we got to and and it's and it's not i don't think that's necessarily a tactic like they're trying to be shady because i've worked with a lot of great people where you know the contract is perfect and everything's good but i I just know myself as 
uh, as someone who wants to come on the set and right. make everybody like me and you don't everything make like waves. this. I don't want to make waves. Right. Um, oh, okay. I'll sign. I'll sign this. But yeah. take the time to read it. Yeah. Take the time to read yeah. it. Also, make sure you get your phone out and photograph it. Yep. And send it to SAG too, and say, "Look, this is what they're making me sign. Is this good or bad?" Right. You know, if you have th- those kind of questions, and if you have an agent, your agent should be doing that stuff for you too. But uh, you know, a lot of the agents are just so frustrated with the Screen Actors Guild <laughs> because they, you know, they're 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 an organization that makes mistakes like anybody. Yeah. You know. So, um, but it is important that you stand up for your rights from the very get go. Right. Well, I want to I want to touch on two things there because you you talked about agents. Um, sometimes you know they, you think agents get you work. They sign all the contracts. All the contracts go. You should be looking at your contracts, right? Oh, that absolutely. your agents absolutely. are negotiating for. You. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. You yeah. Don't, don't don't trust anyone <laughs> except yourself. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, as I I used to sign contracts if, if as long as they said Screen Actors Guild or AFTRA you know, day player or weekly or whatever it was, I mean, then those are pretty much legit, all of those things. Unless they added a writer or an appendix or something, then you need to kind of like make sure that that's fitting with what you're comfortable with. Yeah. You know, there was a time where uh, in after, because before they were together, after had a, a couple contracts where they allowed that they could pay you what you ask for, but it comes out of your residual. So it's like they're paying you with your own money. Whoa. Yeah. A guarantee kind of thing. And it's like, that just seemed to me like, you know, well, that's highway robbery. Right. Because right. what if the show's successful, then, you know, uh, I don't, let, God, I'm getting incensed. <laughs> Sorry. But this Jeez, is great. I on. told you your passion. That's why I wanted you uh, on to talk about oh, this. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and one other thing that you mentioned is, you can't, as a union member, you can call SAG, right? Yeah. Well, and you can get in touch with them about the, if you're having a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you should. Uh, you, yeah. Because they don't know what's being out there mm-hmm. unless you send them a contract or, or the photograph of your contract so that they can deal with it. Um, so, yeah, the stunt performer thing, getting back to that. Sure. The, the stunt performer thing. So their claim, the producer's claim is that, is that my car? <laughs> <laughs> it's my mom. She's here to pick me up. It's the producer. They're listening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, stunt performers. Yeah. The, this side letter thing situation. They, the, the AMPTP basically said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to continue to like classify you into the stunt performer category. And it's not a lot. It's not like it's, it's, um, you know, you actually make a little more on the session fee. But then you lose consecutive employment and the chance to make more money and the chance to be uh, on a on a film for more weeks to be in a bigger part of the residual pool. Mm-hmm. So you're actually, you know, not getting uh, an opportunity to make the kind of money that we should as principal performers, <laughs> protected by the collective bargaining agreement as principals, you know. So right. it's, it's kooky. And, and I, I don't understand their M.O., why they would do that to us? I mean, because we're we're skilled performers. We have specialty skills, and we do amazing things. And if you look at our our Screen Actors Guild uh, movie that we did, which uh, James Cromwell narrates, well, I'll link to it in the show notes. You for should this definitely yeah. link it because I think people who want to be film and television puppeteers should see that and then recognize, oh yeah, puppets have been part of film and television forever. Right. I mean, commercials forever i mean you know so uh it is kind of fun to fun to see and it, 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 the movie actually starts off with james cromwell saying do puppeteers have any relevance in this day and age of cg etc you know so yeah was that james cromwell did so that I, sounded just i, I thought he was of, here kind of did that <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a good it's a good reminder and we showed that to the sag staff too because it's like you know when you look at the big iconic you know the muppets mm-hmm. uh E.T. puppet, you know, and then you go and you see all these puppet. People don't even realize they're puppets, you know, but yeah. they're being performed by professional puppeteers, you know. And it seems that it's coming back. Um, I mean, there was this shift towards CG, but it's all coming back. Right. And like the Star Wars films are using more creatures and puppets and Dark Crystal. And, and you, I know you shared the um, 
uh, it was a Hollywood Reporter article. Oh yeah, uh, about Dark the Mandal- Crystal, the Mandalorian, about the Mandalorian, and all this Yoda. stuff, and how uh, we need more puppets. <laughs> and, right, right. You know, when a big Hollywood industry publication like that is is writing about it, then that means it's happening. You know, yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope so. And I think there's something to be said too for hybrids of you know yeah. the practical puppet doing the lines and creating a performance and interacting with the other actors. And making it that much better because it's there. And then having CG go back and then, you know, maybe accentuate some of the expressions just to make it even more. Yeah. But they can even, they can ruin it too. But <laughs> I think in Cats and Dogs, we, uh, the, in, we, we shot that, uh, I was just, I forget what year, 2000 something. And Cats and Dogs, the cat, the main cat, uh, was performed by Bruce Lenoir, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Bruce is a high energy performer and so gifted. And um, and it's funny because he wasn't going to be the voice. Sean Hayes was going to be the voice. But Bruce studied Sean Hayes and so had a Sean Hayes kind of impersonation that was really funny and, and good. And he, he could improv and he could do stuff and get stuff out of the face that I couldn't – I didn't I, – I was just blown away watching him. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it was – and the CG guy who was there was just kind of folding his arms like – Oh, that's pretty good. I don't have to do that scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he it took work away from him, yeah. and then it became a little bit of like, well, he's taking too much work away from us. You know <laughs> what I mean? In a way, and so we have to, you know, you come on set and you you dazzle and delight, but then you you know then it creates something else, another <laughs> right. problem you got to deal. With. Yeah. Well, let's talk about because um, we talked about the Mandalorian and streaming and new media, and um, you know, there's these these businesses that. Um, appear to i mean i don't have the financial records but netflix and disney plus and all that making money um but then it seems that the contracts that you get for working on shows like that are lower than uh you know regular tv and film projects yeah absolutely well it's the wild west now with streaming yeah it's it's like uh dvds oh they're gonna be here for a long time well no not really (laughs) right it's all heading towards streaming um and and um Netflix has the ability to know exactly how many eyeballs are watching. Right. So for like residuals accounting, I mean, it'd be easy, you'd think in a way. Yeah. But, you know, there's they, they're making all kinds of like greedy kind of ways to not pay us. Yeah. So we as a union have to fight at the collective bargaining and say, no, you know, it, it's kind of like the same thing with basic cable when we – we kind of caved and said, oh, cable's coming on board. This is years ago. And, and uh, we reduced our rates, cable rates, basically. But then all of a sudden, all the advertisers shift to cable, right? Mm-hmm. And so now we're making less. Right. And, you know, as a union, we want to continue to make it so that people can earn a living. Right. But, but then all of a sudden now, like with Netflix and some of these other ones that have this ability to kind of like, oh, it's the Wild West. We can kind of make do whatever we want until we make a stink and say, you know, no, you have to pay us this amount comparable to what we get in theatrical, you know, it's just, and our theatrical movies that are now ending up on Netflix should continue to be residuals coming towards us right. because it's all part of the pie, yeah. you know? And I, and I don't want to, I certainly don't want to paint these streaming services as being nefarious or something. Cause no. I've done projects where, uh, I'll say for Netflix, where one project pays residuals, and I get residuals from that project. Right. The other project, another project, does not. Right. You know. Right. So, but it's this. There's no kind of standard. It can be anything right. when right. you work on one. Of I these think projects. that's something that our, our committee that we're going to get our committee back up and going, and that's going to be one of the things we fight very hard for. Yeah. And I think all the other actors within the guild will support it. Right. Yeah. Well, let's. Um, We've talked, and you kind of touched on this before, but let's talk about non-union work uh, a little bit. Um, and I, I know the answer to this, but I want to ask it so we have it on record. Should union puppeteers do non-union work? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. That's a stab in the back to your brothers. Yeah. Um, and if you're a union performer, why would you want to do a non-union gig? Right. Because you get a little chunk of change and you cover bills for maybe, what, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. But you don't get any pension or health. And you don't, you're stabbing your brothers in the back. You, you we want to say, hey, we are professionals and we have a skill set that's protected by our union. So when you do a non-union job, the corporations win 
and right. we and and the rest of us all of a sudden are being dragged down in a sinking ship. So, I I mean I know people need to work and feed their families, but if you can say no, you're going to be better off in the long run, because once you say once you do a non-union job and it gets out, yeah, that you you'll do non-union work because of your skill set. You're really good, and they want you know, they'll hire you and they'll pay you a chunk of change. But you, it's a, it's a stab in the back to the rest of us who have worked really hard to maintain our principal status. Right. And I, I was at a commercial audition, uh, and I heard a guy, an actor, talking about um, going FICOR. And FICOR right. is a, a financial core, they call it. And it's a loophole for union people to that can't afford to pay their bills. They're not getting enough union work that they can go and work non-union and still maintain their union status but they lose their ability to vote in yeah. screen actors guild and they don't get the screeners for the sag awards etc right. i mean it, it's like a little slap on the wrist but so this guy's talking about going i'm thinking about going ficor and i went i stood up and walked over to him and i said dude do not go ficor because you stab all of us in the back yeah and the corporations win and the more and more we just uh, do this FICOR thing, they're just going to take total advantage of it and keep hiring you as non-union, and you have no pension when you're old and gray, and what are you going to do? Right. I mean, the pension thing alone is huge. Yeah. I think a lot of young people, I didn't realize it when I was starting out that a pension, you know, I, I kind of knew what it was, but didn't really pay much attention to it. But now that I'm collecting... <laughs> Uh, right. I will say it is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And uh, I remember talking to Amy Aquino, who was one of the board members back in the day, and she said, as soon as you can take your early pension, take it. It's your money. Yeah. And it helps you a lot. Yeah. I mean, they, there's something to be said for holding out and waiting. You you get a little bit more money if you – but now nowadays it's like phew, you need it. Right, right. And all my fellow pensioners feel the same way. It's like <laughs> yeah. it, it – it, relieves a burden of you know making a living yeah well i'm almost to pension but i've only i've only actually been in sag and as a sag member for maybe about four years that's when i finally earned it and was able to to join up and stuff but the health insurance alone has right. been fantastic yeah and even though um uh i always joke that my wife has the the real job and <laughs> you know we have health insurance through her oh that's good but it's like the SAG insurance is actually better than her corporate oh, insurance. Absolutely. And so she winds up using it when, you know, uh, right. for things because it's such a better deal and absolutely. we get better rates and stuff. And, um, you know, before I was in SAG, there were always people who were like, I got to get more jobs so I can I can be eligible for the insurance. Yeah. And now I'm right there with them saying, well, come on, I need to get this. Exactly. Well, it's kind of a national debacle with health care. I mean, <laughs> that's for, a podcast topic for another time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, uh, and the eligibility requirements for us to earn the health plan, it's it's scary. It's scary for us scale puppeteers to earn that kind of money. Right. Um, and, it, and it's daunting. And you're always afraid at the end of the, you know, your period of, uh, you know, coverage. It's like, did I make it? Did I make it? <laughs> right. Because it's frightening. Uh, and there was a time, there were good times when I was in both unions, AFTRA and SAG, before they, they merged. And there was no copay. Mm -hmm. I was covered with both plans. I had a couple children, didn't pay for that. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the, the health care was, was its top drawer. It's top drawer health care, but man, it's hard to earn that eligibility sometimes. Yeah. And that's a struggle. Yeah. 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 Well, I want, one other thing about uh, non-union work. Um, what about non-union puppeteers? Should they should they go after non-union work if it's there? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think people need to work and earn a living. Uh, and if you're non-union, you're not breaking any rules, really, other than you should tell the producers that you want to be a union puppeteer. And, and if could you taft heart, heartly me to become a union puppeteer? They probably won't go for it, but at least you put that bug in their ear. Mm -hmm. You know, that you're not just going to do non-union work the rest of your life. You know, you want to be in the union yeah. to earn a pension, earn health benefits, et cetera. Yeah. And I um, I said to this to you before we started recording, but I went to a new media workshop at, um, the at SAG. Yeah. At, at SAG. And um, they were talking about how it is not 
it's not that difficult for a production to become affiliated with the union. And maybe you're still only making your non-union rate of whatever it is, a hundred dollars or whatever right. for the shoot, but that is going towards your health care, It's going right. towards your pension. And it doesn't really cost the producers much more. It's more time because they got to fill out a couple more paperwork right. and they got to call sagging or however that works. Right. But it doesn't take that much more to become it, a union. It, exactly. And if, if they're legitimate producers, they want to be legitimate too. Right. So they should be able to like say, oh, how, how do we become signatory? Right. And you're right. It, it is more paperwork and there's some scrutiny. There's yeah. some scrutiny involved that, you know, you have to jump through a few hoops, but they don't want just anybody willy nilly, anybody to just become signatory. They want people who are going to be accountable for residuals and, and all that stuff. Yeah. So, and this new media contract started off way too low. You mm-hmm. know, I think uh, that's that's one thing our committee is going to work on, too. It's like the new media is going to probably be the standard now for the next 10 years, maybe. Who knows what's next, you know? Yeah. So we need to make sure that we can make a living. Right. I mean, you know, the, the minimum is $100 a day. Well, okay, but you're doing... That same kind of work that you would do for a regular scale day, which is what nine ninety nine eighty something like that a day. Yeah. So I mean, that, the difference is eight hundred dollars or something. <laughs> Come on, you're doing the same work. Yeah, but you're getting so yeah. And and like I did a uh, a couple like um, uh, college uh, thesis kind of student films, mm-hmm. and you know, in that situation, it's like yeah, I mean, they they actually have a signatory for those college uh you know student film kind of things but i had just as much fun on those shoots as i did on you know regular big high paying jobs too yeah i mean and it's also you're gaining experience and yeah and you're helping helping filmmakers that might hire you in the, in the, future. <laughs> in the future you never know right. yeah. you never know yeah well um throughout all of this uh, communication is such a big factor uh, communication between puppeteers what's going on what's happening on films but also communications with producers communications with SAG uh, the SAG offices and you've started a SAG after puppeteers Facebook group uh, right. with Patrick Johnson right. to kind of help that communication and get us all exactly. together Exactly exactly yeah and you know take advantage of technology it's the easy way to reach everybody if there's an emergency or something you know we can blanket out to everybody on Facebook who's are, who are SAG puppeteers. The requirements to join the group are to be a union member. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've had to decline a few people just because they're more puppet enthusiasts. Right. And it's like we're talking about professional issues that uh, could actually be sensitive information for collective bargaining. Right. So we want to keep it just people who are in the union that have a little more stake in the game. Yeah. Um, but – yeah, I think you can read some of the, the things, but you can't, you can't participate in discussions. But we have about a hundred members, mm-hmm. and I think it's it's it, before we used to have a database of of everybody's emails, right? Mm-hmm. Back in two thousands or whatever, but they've all changed, right. and so this is like an easy way to get to people quickly. Yeah, and also have discussions about what's going on. You know. Yeah. So. Well, and I wanted to touch on, you're talking about the committee coming back and, um, you know, kind of reform. We just got to meet and stuff like that. Um, do you have to be in L.A. to be part of this committee or can you be a New York puppeteer or right. s- somewhere else who's a SAG union member, but right. to be part of the committee? No, we're a national. We're, we're going to be a national committee. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were a national committee. Right. We had people in New York. We had Marty Robinson. We had Dave Rudman. We had, you know, the guys back there, Peter Linz and... Uh, Matt Vogel and the guys back there yeah. are, are, you know, New York. And so they're part of Fran Brill was part of it too. And, and then also the branches, we had members in the branches who understood puppets and what puppeteering is within the contracts and stuff too. So it's national. Right. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to hit it hard. Uh, there's a few little hoops we got to jump through to get back on the, on the good graces of the committee uh, guidelines and, and that sort of thing. But we do have some contracts coming up where we want to move this thing, get going so that we have a, 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 a dog in the fight, you know? Right. Well, I definitely I definitely want to be involved. And if folks want to get involved, how can they do that? Can they? Well, it'll be contacting me yeah. pretty much okay. at this point. Um, I was the former chair of the National Committee that, you know, we, we've been defunct like for seven, maybe seven years now or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not still alive as a caucus, right? Within right. The, within the group, and right. and the SAG recognizes us, and the board recognizes us because there's a lot of people on the board that helped us 
in our early fights against producers and whatnot. So, so they're aware of us. I mean, there's, look, I just tell one story that just, uh, it was an emergency situation where during the collective bargaining, uh, or the working wages committee meetings where, you know, we, we as actors all come together and figure out what we want to ask for and how we're going to deal with the negotiations for the next contract. And they they last three years or whatever. And this was for the commercials contract, I believe. Um, and background performers were still just kind of new within SAG and covered. Well, they were being asked to manipulate cardboard cutouts so they could fill a room, like a stadium. Like a stadium, yeah. Right. And so they would have cardboard cutouts, but then the they were asking the background performers to, to wiggle and move the cardboard cutouts. And the background performers said, no, it's cutting people out of work, first of all. They need more background performers instead of cardboard cutouts. Right. And then they're also encroaching upon our collective bargaining agreement status as principal performers. As puppeteers, yeah. And claiming that they need to be paid as principal performers. And the board, for some reason, went, oh, that's a good idea. That will show them that, that no, they have to pay principal, right? But instead, it just made us look like idiots in a way, you know? Yeah. And we weren't very happy about it. Thankfully, Frank Oz wrote a letter. Uh, I think Steve Whitmire got involved and, and wrote a letter and, and like said, no, you can't diminish us like this or let right. one group within SAG diminish another group to try and get something for themselves by stomping on us. Yeah. And it didn't work. Yeah. So luckily that just got whew, went away. Yeah. But that was an, a, 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 a situation where puppeteers rallied quickly. We got together and said, no, we got to do something. This is, <laughs> this is too scary. We're yeah. being, you know, being encroached upon like that that's rude yeah i i remember early on i was thinking well i don't have much uh time i was raising kids or whatever can i volunteer to help and you know and i'd go to meetings but there's some that i could make uh and then it's it's about volunteerism mm -hmm. it's about you know hey this this is an important part of your livelihood so yeah you you, you have a dog in the fight like i said i mean you you, you really should step up and if you care about it, then be part of the committee or be part of being in the discussion group on the page. I mean, if there's things that you want to get get to, you know, let's do it. And we're only going to do it as if we're solid, if we're, yeah. you know, solidarity, wave the <laughs> union flag because that's what we are. You know, we're union. Yeah. Um, and unions are getting a lot of heat from all, you know, the current status of our nation, you know, where for some reason. But. If we're union strong and everybody stands together and holds the line, I mean, all it takes is everybody just to say, no, there's power in no. They hand you a stunt contract? No. Yeah. You know, you don't want to make waves, but at the same time, you don't want to just cave and just say, okay, I'll sign it. Right. Because what that does is set a precedent for them to say, look, you got so many people that have signed a stunt contract. You know, you guys don't care. No, we do care, and we need to show the producers that we do care. Right. We don't want to be called apples when we're oranges, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Kevin, um, thank you so much for talking about this. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, maybe if there's any significant changes or something, we'll have you back on the show so we keep people up to date. Absolutely. But yeah. thank you for all your work, and um, well, I'm looking forward to volunteering right along with you well, and, great. And, we'll, and getting it done. We'll put you to work. <laughs> thank we'll you. you to work. And, Grant, thank you for what you do, too. I think it's really great that you're, uh, you know, celebrating our craft and, and our professionalism and what we have to do in the business. I mean, I, I appreciate you uh, bringing light to our our, our puppetry skills. <laughs> it is my pleasure, and I'm happy to do it. Thank Great. you so much, Kevin. All right, Grant. Many thanks to Kevin Carlson for being on this episode. I'll have links to some of the things we discussed in the show notes for this episode, episode number 36.5, over at underthepuppet.com. Well, that's going to do it for this special app-exclusive episode of Under the Puppet. If you have a topic that you would like me to discuss on a future episode, please let me know. You can send it to me via email at underthepuppet at gmail.com or via Twitter, where the show is at username Under the Puppet. You can also find the show on Facebook by searching for Under the Puppet or connect with the show on Instagram at username Under the Puppet. Let me know what issues we should be talking about. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Steven Staver. 
Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind the scenes information, and exclusive bonus episodes. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2020 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachogo Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.